Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors. To out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is Whiskey Wednesday, November 4th, 2020, and you're listening to episode 22. Today we speak with Jack and Stephen Teeling of Teeling Irish Whiskey in Ireland. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. The history of whiskey began in Ireland around 1000 AD, when Christian monks brought distilling techniques back from the Mediterranean. They then modified the techniques to create a drinkable spirit called Uskibetha or Uskiba, which means water of life. Records documenting the early days of whiskey production in Ireland are scarce, in part because there was no regulation governing production. Even once whiskey making became well established in Ireland, knowledge of its practice was passed on orally from one generation of makers to another. Thus, many of the details of the history have been lost. That said, there are documents referring to Irish whiskey dating back to 1405 and Scotch whiskey back to 1494. By the 18th century, the demand for Irish whiskey had grown dramatically. And by 1790, sales of Irish whiskey accounted for 66% of Great Britain's total duty on spirits. In 1779, Ireland was home to 1,228 registered distilleries. An act of Parliament assessing a tax on production, however, passed that same year, forcing many distilleries underground. By 1790, there remained in Ireland only 246 licensed distilleries, and by 1821, that number had fallen to 32. In 1823, authorities finally acknowledged the mess they'd made and reformed the existing legislation, making distilleries more attractive for prospective licensees. By 1827, the number of licensed distilleries in Ireland had risen to 82, and by 1835, it had risen to 93. Also by 1823, the city of Dublin was home to Ireland's five largest licensed distilleries, and the city would go on to be responsible for the largest combined output of whiskey in the world. By 1878, the reputation of Dublin whiskey was such that it could sell for a 25% premium over other Irish whiskies and enjoyed a demand of five times that of scotch. With liquor laws updated and ever more licensed distilleries entering the market, Irish whiskey had become the most popular spirit in the world. So how did the industry all but disappear in a matter of decades? At the turn of the 20th century, tremendous change and tumult visited the Emerald Isle. The Irish War of Independence and a subsequent civil war, and then a trade war in the 1920s and 30s, cut off whiskey exports to its biggest markets, the United Kingdom, from which it was newly independent, and its Commonwealth countries. Additionally, due to a nationwide prohibition on alcohol sales, exports to the United States stood at zero from 1920 to 1933. All of these factors greatly impacted the Irish whiskey industry and forced the closure of many distilleries. By the 1960s, there remained in Ireland a small handful of brands and makers. And in 1966, the Jameson, Powers and Cork distilleries collapsed their operations and merged to form Irish distillers. By the 1970s, but two Irish whiskey producers remained. Irish distillers, and in Northern Ireland, still a country within the United Kingdom, Bushmills. In the 1970s and 80s, when whiskey was fast losing market share to clear spirits such as vodka, tequila, and gin, Irish whiskey began its remarkable, albeit slow, resurgence. In 1987, the Cooley Distillery, the first new Irish whiskey distillery in over a century, and located close to Ireland's border with Northern Ireland, opened its doors. And in 1988, international spirits conglomerate Pernod Ricard took over the Irish distillers. Things, however, didn't really start picking up for Irish whiskey until the early 2000s, when whiskey consumption became increasingly associated with a stylish lifestyle. Today, there are 32 whiskey distilleries operating on the island, with a long list of planned or under construction distilleries in development. To see a map of Ireland's current distilleries and a list of ones under construction, please visit our website for today's show notes. One Irish family's distilling roots date to 1782, and that family stands at the forefront of Irish whiskey's renaissance. In 1987, John Teeling opened the Cooley Distillery, and in 2012, his sons Jack and Stephen established Teeling Irish Whiskey, opening in 2015 the city of Dublin's first new distillery in 125 years. Today we speak with Jack and Stephen Teeling and learn more about their family's rich whiskey history. 
Stay with us. Hey, do you like whiskey, food, and adventure? I do. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise. I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in our World of Wheezy segment host here on the podcast, and Whiskey, A Chef's Journey. That chef. That's right, the project that started this very podcast. The series stars our very own chef, Louise Leonard, winner of Emmy-winning The Taste on ABC. And explores and connects the worlds of whiskey and food, city by city, country by country. Would you like to see this spirited culinary adventure on a TV near you? Well, you can by helping us finish the pilot episode through our crowdfunding campaign. For more information, including behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and incentives. And to make a pledge, visit our website, whiskeyachefsjourney.com. Now. Well, I think it's a cheers to that. (laughs) Bless. Cheers. Cheers. Today on Spirits of Whiskey, we have as our very special guests, the Brothers Teeling. Jack Teeling is founder and managing director, and his brother Stephen Teeling is sales and marketing director at Teeling Whiskey Company in Dublin, Ireland. Jack and Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, delighted to be here. Yes, welcome to the show. It's lovely to have you with us. Very excited to have our first Irish whiskey on the show, which is near and dear to my heart, if you couldn't tell by my name. Um, pretty Irish. (laughs) So, so gentlemen, you guys have been in whiskey for a long time. I I kind of feel like it's in your blood based on your family history. So DNA indeed. Yes. So I would love to hear your whiskey journeys when you were children, how did whiskey influence, you know, your life? And then how did you decide to keep going with whiskey as adults? Yeah, look, uh, we're both very lucky that we've been introduced and brought into the category and given, I suppose, the love for Irish whiskey from our father, who set up the first new distillery in Ireland in over 100 years and broke then a monopoly of one company controlling the whole category when he set up Cooley Distillery in 1987. Uh, At that stage, I was turning 11 in my my 11th year, um, and I suppose... I, I grew up around the journey and the trials and tribulations of building a new distillery and trying to relaunch a lot of old brands at a time when Irish whiskey was quite a small, struggling category, um, and particularly in the 80s and, and early 90s. But I was lucky enough that I got to join the distillery in uh, the early 2000s, really when Irish whiskey was taking off. And the unique position that Cooley Distillery had um, really, I suppose, Stoked uh, a passion, um, desire, uh, and uh, you know, I suppose the basis of what we we managed to achieve in the Tilling Whiskey Company. But it was a very, very entrepreneurial environment that Stephen and myself mm. got brought around, and I suppose we got used to having balls of whiskey popping up all around the house. But uh, <laughs> uh, I suppose <laughs> a nip here, a nip there. Yeah, yeah. Well, the understanding of, of I suppose the business side in particular, because you know, it's one thing that people don't understand is that our father never drank any of the whiskey that he made so uh oh, wow. so really we had, to, we, we, we had to make up for us yeah <laughs> yeah we had to discover ourselves <laughs> well, how to enjoy you know the actual pleasures of drinking whiskey and uh, compensatory drinking there exactly for doing it for the family but yeah i think we, we were we were in a unique <laughs> unique position where we were given the opportunity to travel around in particular to a lot of international markets and go out and fight the cause for Irish whiskey in, in a lot of markets, in particular in the US. And mm-hmm. I think uh, it was at a time where Irish whiskey was only really just getting started in terms of uh, trying to claw back some of the things that it had lost over the sort of darker years and sure. getting exposure to a lot of different um, movements that were happening at the time, you know, in the early 2000s, all the way up to sort of when uh, when Cooley was sold to Beam, we saw a lot of stuff happen with American whiskey. We saw a lot of trends change. And I suppose myself and Jack were part of a lucky generation of Irish people who got to travel around the world, um, live in different countries, get more of a, a global outlook for our generation. That has you know, been a, a unique position that we can take a lot of those learnings that probably previous generations didn't have and apply them to Irish whiskey. That's very cool. Sure. At the time, Americans had access to Jameson and Bushmills, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there wasn't much more than that being made either. No, no, and it was you know 
you can go into the the sob story of all the dark days of Irish whiskey from the t- 1930s up to the 1980s, 90s, when you know mm-hmm. the industry imploded. It survived because the Irish government forced the last remaining distilleries to merge together. So, so Powers, Jamison, Tullamore Jew, Bushmills mm-hmm. were all under one roof. And unfortunately, you know, a lack of competition breeds a lack of innovation, a lack of 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 you know um, upstarts pushing people to respond and, uh, you know, became very insular. Mm-hmm. And no risk-taking. Mm. Yeah, no risk-taking. I think the, the, the hardest thing was, was trying to manage four uh, or, you know, three, four different families that all had their own fiefdoms originally and they were all fighting for attention. And it took small pastiche company to come in and take over that monopoly to, to really unlock some of the opportunities for Irish whiskey when Pernod Ricard bought the then monopoly of Irish distillers at the end yes. of the 80s. Um, mm-hmm. And they took a very different view and they looked at the, the one brand that didn't have a lot of the legacy and baggage and that was Jemison. And they saw the opportunity for, you know, a very unique style of whiskey that had bags and bags of province and heritage that had missed a generation. And, uh, you know, they put their, their energy into creating you know, uh, a modern expression and, uh, you know, re-energize the category. And, you know, they brought their brand building and route to market strengths and, and it worked. And, uh, you know, I suppose Cooley Distillery as a new entry, you know, they helped in terms of bring someone else into the category to challenge some of the perceptions and, and do things a little bit differently. And when it was sold, when we were, our family was controlling it in 2011, 2012, I think it opened up people's eyes again to the opportunity with Irish whiskey and, and it kind of started the second wave of the evolution or revolution, as you want to call it, within Irish whiskey that we're enjoying or we're in the middle of right now. Mm-hmm. Jack, you were 11 when your father opened Cooley. <laughs> uh, Stephen, yeah. how old were you? I was, I think, almost eight years old. So yeah. okay. uh, <laughs> I had a while to go before I developed a, a fully, <laughs> the best probably consumer insights you'll ever get is uh, what people say to you uh, when they're tasting whiskey at your stand, because they'll tell you if they like something or they'll tell you if they don't like something. And at the time, there was a huge amount of, I wouldn't say prejudice towards Irish whiskey, but there was a lack of understanding of what it was. And I think through mm-hmm. The journey of working with Cooley, we we really saw how we were opening people's eyes. And I think when Cooley was bought by Beam, I think myself and Jack were probably against it because we only felt we were we were on the cusp of, you know, really something great. And it, it had planted a lot of seeds of what we felt was maybe missing in the category and what we could do ourselves. So when you guys were of age to start working, did you start working uh, with your dad and learning the tools of the trade? Well... Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, my view, my, I, like when I was growing up, uh, my view was I, both of our guests have monkey shoulder. You just can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we weren't. I uh, like you know, it's my father is a, is a quite a strong character um, and uh, does things his own way. And uh, you know, having endured, you know, or let's say, uh, I wouldn't say endured it, but I experienced that firsthand as a you know father son uh, mm-hmm. relationship. Uh, you know, I didn't barely see myself going into to working um, or forum and uh, you know my initial route in terms of business wasn't forum so I actually end up doing commerce and just general business in, in university I specialized in finance the masters I end up working in investment banking in Ireland and Australia and then traveled around uh, Australia New Zealand and came back to Ireland and uh, you know must have been in a very positive frame of mind and kind of had found myself in my travel where my father invited me to come in and work with him just for a period of time, just to help me figure out what I wanted to do. And I was uh, very firmly of the view it was only going to be a relatively short period of time. But 12 years later, I was still in there. But, uh, you know, it was quite a different experience because I saw firsthand, really, I suppose, the opportunity for Irish whiskey. But also I'd move from, you know, looking at numbers on spreadsheets or whatever, you know, screens, actually being in something that was very tactile in terms of, of being involved in actually making yeah. something, a bottle of whiskey that was uniquely Irish and could travel around the world. And we had this unique role to do. And I felt I could add some value, bringing just a different lens, a younger perspective into what the guys were doing in Irish whiskey. And I, and I actually 
I made a conscious decision that that was where I wanted to be. And I, I doubled down and I did a part-time master's in international business stroke marketing to upskill myself specifically on what I felt was required within Cooley Distillery. And uh, I started my journey there. And I suppose like everything else, I always wanted to do something myself, but I was kept given all these opportunities with Cooley Distillery and I became the sales marketing director in 2007 and uh, the managing director in 2010. And I was there, I suppose, at the helm when it was sold. But I felt I'd still had bags more things to do within the category and I only felt like it really only getting started and I really felt there was unfinished business so when Cooley was sold I really wanted to do something myself and take all those learnings and insights and apply it to a new venture that I suppose we could awesome. really put our own mark on on what I felt Irish whiskey needed <laughs> <laughs> You already had the party. I wasn't even there. He'd gone down the country or something like that. I was like, what am I doing back here? When he came back from Australia, he set up the one-man London office. So he actually was, there was a way. And uh, it, it was uh, uh, following a certain young lady that he had uh, spent some time with <laughs> in as well. So, uh, and so two would-be playboys of the Western world found themselves <laughs> back at the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, maybe we went out and saw that the grass wasn't necessarily greener on the other side. <laughs> and uh, mm. working, uh, working in large organizations, uh, be it true finance or anything else, you're a small cog in a very big machine. And uh, I think sometimes you have to leave to to know mm-hmm. maybe uh, what you want. And I think um, it definitely solidified in my mind some of the benefits of of probably being involved in a family and probably having a lot more emotional connection to the things that you're doing. Yeah. Cooley, when it was sold, did you guys know, like before it was sold, that you guys were going to start your own distillery, or is that something that came after the sale was done and you decided we still want to do whiskey? Well, these processes take quite some time. And I remember around 2010, 11, there was just a lot of interest in, in the category of Irish whiskey because of the continued growth that was happening. And we had a lot of different people come and talk to us because there was no one else. It was just the big guy, a big giant in the room and ourselves. And if you wanted to get production assets and, and inventory and, and, and some brands, um, um, Cooley was the only game in town. So, so we were getting all these people coming like Centauri. We had, you know, grants. We had a multitude of, of different brand form and we're all looking at the category and, and attracted to it. Mm-hmm. Brown Foreman and people like that. Yeah. So it was quite distracting from our view, trying to build a business. Um, but, you know, I suppose by all those things happening, you kind of go, OK, well, what would you do if something did happen? So it forced you to think and you see all these opportunities. And, you know, if you weren't involved in Cootie, what would you do? Um, and it became clear to me quite early that if I was ever going to do something again, there was this gap. There was something that was missing, in particular with the emergence of urban breweries and distilleries around the world. Mm-hmm. And that you know, you looked at Dublin, and Dublin is basically the cradle of urban whiskey distillation. Mm-hmm. There's nowhere else, no city-based location in the world that has anywhere near the provenance and heritage and tradition of making whiskey than Dublin has. Sure, in Scotland, it's a rural affair largely. It's a total, yeah. Well, you know, they would have had some other smaller distilleries in the early days, but nothing of the scale. Like you know, people don't understand how big Dublin whiskey. And, you know, the urban distilleries in Ireland in general, like in Cork and in Belfast, massive distilleries, you know, the, the big brands of today are still holding on to that heritage. You know, Jemison, Powers, they're Dublin brands. They came originally from Dublin distilleries. They might be made down in Cork now, but that's where they came from. Um, and that's what was a driver of the golden era of the 19th century when Irish whiskey was the biggest exported whiskey around the world and Dublin whiskey in particular drove that right. um, because it was seen as the premium, the best uh, of what you could get from Ireland. Um, and the reason for that was it was where you could export. So yeah. uh, it was very simple. Ireland is just such a small market. To be a success, you have to be able to export. Question. You were opening the first new distillery in Dublin in 125 years. Correct. Did you face regulatory barriers? Yes. <laughs> yes. A lot of And the reason for that is because When the last distillery had opened its doors in Dublin, they didn't have things like permitting or planning processes. It just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So we were the first 
Dublin distillery to ever have to go through all that process. Mm -hmm. So that legal code really didn't exist. Yeah. They didn't even know what to ask for. Yeah. I think they were trying to work out Mm -hmm. how to apply maybe some form of regulation to something they had never gone through before. And I think it was more about an education process for a lot of them as to what even distilling was. Mm -hmm. My view of the world is they were trying to, like a lot of cities, they were trying to push industry out of the city and put it to, you know, industrial parks and so forth. They wanted less trucks coming into the city center and different things like that. So there was a, you know, a a master plan for the city center, which reduced industry, but, you know, bring in mixed commercial and so forth. But just down the road from us, Guinness had just built one of the largest breweries in the world. It's no small operation. It's pretty big. It's pretty big. And they had just gone through a massive capital investment there as they shut down their, their London brewery and consolidated all the production from the regional breweries in Ireland into St. James's Gate. So my view was like, hold on a second. They allowed that to happen? And why, you know, distilleries are so much smaller in terms of the footprint and particularly for what we were going to do. So there had to be an angle there. Yeah. Uh, but it's easier said than done. And, and I'll be honest with you. By going through the process and all the challenges, I have a huge newfound respect for everything that my father did uh, in Cooley because you know, he was doing it as the first new distillery yeah. in the whole of Ireland. And, uh, you know, I suppose when I joined, they'd gone through all the hardships of, of, of what was required and that, and I came in just to, at a different stage in its evolution. So to be there from the start and having to do all that work, you know, it's hard. It's not easy. But, you know... My view was that we could be the first, it's going to be the hardest first, and others will follow. And it's proven to be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, I, what was interesting was that a very high level within Dublin City Council, they saw the opportunity, they saw the need, and they saw it as a, you know, a great way of reviving an old industry, but also the cultural and touristic aspect of it. And I suppose the multifaceted approach to developing different regions of the city centre. So no one wants a whole city suburb or area just to be all offices or all residential it needs to be uh, you know multifaceted and and, you know they saw distilleries nearly as much as a cultural aspect or or attraction that could add you know a bit of personality and and particularly in the area that we're in the area that we're in in dublin this is the area where all the breweries distilleries industry was it's the liberties it was the old industrial engine of the city behind Mm -hmm. the city wall And up to very, very recently, there was still a lot of industry there. Sure. Well, around the world, beginning in the 1950s, urban planners were trying to move industry, manufacturing, out of the cities. Yeah. And now they're doing everything they can to bring it back in. Yeah. And I think we were a little bit behind the curve because it already started happening. Like, you know, it's happening in Brooklyn. It was happening in parts of of cities all around the U.S. And it was happening in Europe. You see it in Berlin and, and larger cities. But I suppose Dublin was... You know, look, and where we are, we're just a small rock in the middle of the Atlantic. Yeah. So uh, we're not at the cutting edge of urban planning or anything like that. So we took a bit of education and ex- uh-huh. uh, showing them what has happened in other cities and why it's uniquely, Dublin was u- a unique example of why we should do it. And, and they, it was great. At a high level, they bought into it. It still didn't make it. You know, the paper pushers and the people who dotted the I's across the T's, it took a lot to get them on board. But we were at one stage... The head planner was said, look, you put in that planning application, we're going to refuse it. And once you get a refuse, it's very hard to, to reopen it. But we believed in what we were doing. And thankfully, uh, we got good support at a high level that, that, that got it through. Um, and the local community wanted it, which was even better. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of plans, you know, in sort of high-rise developments or, you know, just uh, uh, office developments or hotels, they got a lot of planning objections. The local community could see we're adding value and, and as you said just bringing industry back into the area and we're going to create jobs and, and we're going to create a bit of energy and vibrancy around the area which i believe we have mm-hmm. so when you guys were thinking up this idea together to do this mm-hmm. who thought of hey let's do our own for uh, bringing it back into the city and um, probably a lot of the elements that had been applied to to cooley were just difficult to implement because these were old brands with legacy it was an older generation who was running that distillery that a lot of the views and I suppose uh, some of the insights that Jack had couldn't be implemented because you can't reinvent old brands. Um, you you can you know rebrand, you can do different things, but I think this was a fresh chance 
to apply a lot of the learnings and insights that we both had learned um, from being out in the trenches trying to sell Irish whiskey and maybe try and apply the logic to a new venture and a clean slate, you know, back into the city. You could talk about now in the future rather than going to maybe sort of these older buildings and, and do something different. But definitely Jack always had a view that I think the city needed uh, a new lease of life and, you know, a distillery was the perfect fix. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That suggests that the Phoenix on the Teeling label has even deeper meaning. Yeah, it does. It resonates very strongly with why and what we're trying to achieve with our whiskeys, our brand, our distillery home. And we were a strong believer in it was the, the right iconography to use. And uh, Sure, you were rebirthing a brand that, that actually has roots in the 18th century. We'd like to hear that story. Yeah, yeah. So our family, obviously, you know, we're talking about our immediate history, but our family original roots. And I think what, what was appealing to me in particular was I wanted to, to get away from, from Cooley and talking about brands that we no longer were involved with. But, you know, that's that we wanted to create a new chapter, but we want to go right back, right back to our original origins within the industry, right back to when our family first got involved in Irish whiskey and Dublin mm -hmm. whiskey. And we were lucky that our family started in 1782 when Walter Teeling had a, literally a small true craft distillery, um, as they would have been back then, a real mom and pop type operation uh, on Marable Lane, which is in the Liberties. But, you know, at that time, people must realize that if you're in a merchant family or, you know, in industry in general in the city centre, there's a good chance you would have been involved in beer or distilling of some kind. And there was 37 other small distilleries really just catering for the local Dublin community. And it went through a couple of different generations. It went from Walter to John Teeling. And then it was actually assumed into a much larger development that happened on Marble and became the Marble Lane Distillery, mm -hmm. which was owned by William Jemison, who was John Jemison's son, uh, very ancestral even to this day. And uh, I suppose uh, we were out of the industry until... Our father got back into it in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, but we always knew that we had that connection, but we didn't know the ins and outs of it. And so when we were setting up the Teeling Whiskey Company, you know, we had to go back and dig to find those roots, to make sure that they were solid and that they were real. <laughs> and we had a guy who went to Dublin Castle and dug up all the, the old records. And once we had that, in Ireland, I remember I was telling my friends, oh, I'm going to, like, you know... <laughs> going to have the, you know, the Teeling Whiskey Company and we're going to have, you know, we're thinking about the different names. I'm thinking about putting you know, Teeling Whiskey on the label. And they were like, well, you can't do that. But who the hell do you think you are? You're such an your ego. is <laughs> massive. Like, you know, it's not really an Irish thing to do to be so, you know, out there and put your own surname on the label. But, you know, I just felt it was the right thing to do. And it was the, uh -huh. just, again, to have something that was real. And yeah. and, and we have since 1782 on our label. and. Wow. That's a while back. <laughs> now that we've come through to, uh, you know, building the new distillery and that look, we're coming into our own product. We're evolving it now into Reborn in 2012. Yeah. Just to give our, our listeners added perspective, Walter Teeling passed the operation on to his son, John. Yes. In 1791. That's the year Mozart died. Yes. <laughs> That's a lot of history. It is a lot of history. And, uh, you know, we're all about, look, being respectful to the history that's there and, and understanding where we have come from and understanding the people we're standing on the shoulders of giants but people don't care about that i'll be honest with you you know it's great to have that but it's what are you doing today to re-energize and to represent dublin irish healing whiskey to a new generation of people and that's that's what draws the passion and the interest and what we're all about and i felt mm -hmm. i'll be honest with you i felt i felt very strongly that there was no brand out there it really was <laughs> representing modern Ireland in a positive way because a lot of the, all the yeah. brands are all legacy. Mm -hmm. brands. We've been around for a long, long time. They won't be doing new uh, <laughs> interesting things then. But you know, I felt as a you know a, a young Irish man in my thirties when I sent it up. No, no longer in my thirties, but uh, when I said when we said it, uh, <laughs> we can do the math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like age, uh, <laughs> age, uh, hell of a lot. It kind of look. It's eight years. I don't know where the eight years have gone, but anyway, you're now vintage reserve. <laughs> I, I like a good whiskey. I'm improving with age, you know. So <laughs> to build up what Shaq is saying is, I think as as 
our generation is looking at Irish whiskey in a very different way from previous generations. And I think that then could be applied to a new way in which Irish whiskey could be presented globally. Um, and a lot of Irish brands throughout generations have been very nostalgic. So they've been always about the good old days rather than about now and the future. And I think our generation had an opportunity to travel and be outward looking and probably <laughs> get experiences in, in a lot of different countries that previous generations didn't have. And for us, we wanted something that didn't just trade off the fact that it was from Ireland. Yeah. We wanted it to be, you know, I suppose a quality premium representation of this new generation making Irish whiskey mm -hmm. and felt that, you know, in other categories, people had done it um, and it presented a new way for, let's say, gin or bourbon tequila but nobody had really done that for for irish whiskey and um now was our chance and i suppose it was a clean slate by taking mm. i suppose your old family name which is <laughs> very traditional but putting a, a new slant on it as the new generation was very very innovative at the time yeah. and i think gave us a lot of energy and i think that's why the distillery in dublin we get people in to see the whiskey being made that they had worked with and they're a very good team. So the Phoenix then is rising from the ashes of a brand, the ashes of a whiskey making tradition, and the economic ashes of a city and and and, and a nation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we were looking for a symbol to represent that as best we possibly could, and uh, you know, we looked at different things. And you know, again, uh, we, we the designers presented. We, they listened to you, and we said, "Look, this is what we want to get across." And they presented these different things, but but you know. I was very literal. I said, no, how about you're in a phoenix rising from a pot still? Because at the core of it, it it's, the, yeah. it's a revival. It's, you know, it's not brand new. So it is literally, you know, the, the industry, the Dublin whiskey uh, industry was literally destroyed, gone, disappeared. Mm -hmm. And we had to bring it back. I don't know, just the, the whole understanding of what phoenix, phoenixes do and so forth. We thought it was a very strong story and in a subtle way. Um, so, so it wasn't in your face, but you know, it could explain to people and then hopefully it would resonate. Mm -hmm. And we also like to, to have the spirit of Dublin, I suppose, the character of the city. So let's talk about the distillery itself for a moment. I know it's brick and mortar. It took a while to put it up. Was it four years ago to build it? No, it didn't take us that long at the end. You founded the company in 2012, opened the doors in 2015. Yeah. Yeah, we found the site in, in August 2012, went through a couple of different designers to try and understand what we were trying to achieve. Again, it's like, you know, I can, I can talk for hours and people can you go, yeah, 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 yeah. And you think that they understand what you're going to, you, what you want, but then they come back and present something that's totally different. So, so I had to fire the first design team altogether before we even went in for planning um, and then uh, found someone who had very tastefully restored an old distillery building just around the corner who understood what it meant to fit in yet stand out and be respectful to the area so, so we end up going with this uh, it's a modern distillery but we use materials that would have been used in other buildings around the area so so it doesn't jar too much with the overall look and feel of the area but stands out hopefully for the right reasons tell us about the installation of your pot still Yes. Yeah, so the, again, we did things a little bit differently. We we knew what we wanted in terms of design. We wanted to recreate the old Dublin Postal designs. Uh, we had our CAD drawings and uh, we went all around the world looking for, you know, people to, to build them with Scotland to all the usual suspects there around Europe. And we ended up going with an Italian company called Frilly, who have been making copper stills for, for hundreds of years, but mainly for the grappa industry, um, but have also moved more into whiskey as well. Uh, but these were the largest pot stills that they ever ever had made at the time. So it was a bit of a risk uh, there. Yeah, we, we did our due diligence and, and, you know, at the end of the day, I'll be honest with you, it's turning copper. Um, it's, it's, you know, how you run them and everything else is, is, is going into it. So, so, so they uh, made them in Italy, they came over and actually trying to fit them in the building was, was a very That's what I'm talking about, interesting, right there. Uh, <laughs> It's like, you know, you had an inch or probably a half an inch on either side of the stills uh, coming through the openings that we had. And, uh, and we were adamant we didn't want to take the roof off of the, the distillery to get them in, which was fine. So we, we got them in on these little roller skates, which was very nerve-wracking because once you dent them, they're dented for life. <laughs> yeah. 
th- these were big capital investments, and I think uh, the uh, I think there was a question mark over whether Alex had got his measurements correct <laughs> at some stages. That mm. uh, he was trying to spin it that he's taken the roof off Irish whiskey when in reality he was uh, getting us a lot of sleepless nights. But I think uh, they. Uh, yeah. We got there in the end, but um, definitely the fact that it was uh, it was captured all on video as well shows probably uh, mm. uh, some of the stress that was on the face. I think when uh, the heart of the distillery was for the benefit of our listeners, Alex is Alex Chasco, uh, yes. the master distiller at Teeling, who, as it happens, is American. For a scene, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> he's, probably- <laughs> <laughs> he's an honorary Irish guy now, yeah. From, uh, he's from uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, he's been a great asset. Uh, he's been uh, first hire back in June 2012, uh, worked with us previously in Cooley, and you know, shared the same vision of wanting to do something different and understanding, really, I suppose, the levers that you can pull to, to evolve and to, to deliver a lot of flavor. Um, his background would have been craft brewing and in technology. and end up going to Scotland, doing a a master's in uh, distilling and brewing and uh, bumped into an Irish lady who dragged him back over to Ireland. So uh, (laughs) I have a lot to thank the Irish ladies of the world for dragging uh, dragging him uh, back to Ireland. And uh, as he said, he's a great asset. And, uh, you know, when we're bottling up a whiskey, there's a tasting panel of Steve and myself um, and Alex and a gentleman called Ian Wood, who happens to be a, a a young Scotsman as well, who is our operations manager. So, so you know, before anything gets bottled, it goes through four pallets to make sure that it's both up to scratch. And you might ask the question of why is it uh, my signature that goes on the bottles? Well, you know, <laughs> someone has to make the final decision. And as the older brother, uh, and I suppose uh, <laughs> the eldest ceiling involved in it, I get the responsibility to make sure that each bottle of teeling whiskey it's, you know, the right marks and there's a good representation of what we want to all the bottles to be. Great. Yes. So each bottle is graced by your imprimatur. That's correct. And well, even we have some uh, single pot still, or is it our black pits now? Black pits, sorry, that we have Alex, Alex Chasco, uh, still by Alex Chas- Chasco's on it. So, so we're letting Alex uh, uh, get his own uh, limelight as well. So so I'm not taking all the all the glory for okay. myself. So the first <laughs> style of whiskey that you guys did was that the small batch coming off the stove. Yeah. So you know when we were we were uh, starting off and um, back in 2012, and look, it is even to now. You know, the majority of Irish whiskey that is consumed and is enjoyed, and the style that people just expect is blend whiskey, and you know, big brands. We all know of Irish whiskey uh, are blends, and uh, you know that lighter, uh, approachable style has worked tremendously well in terms of getting new people on board to drink Irish whiskey. And uh, you know, we were looking at where do we feel, what can we do to get people on a journey of discovery to try different expressions of Irish whiskey. And you know, we could go full throttle and go after the single malt category, or we could try and create a bridge to try and get people. You know, who are used to or have experienced Irish whiskey as a blend, you know, get them starting on the journey of asking the question of what Irish whiskey can be. So, so we said, well, look, what can we do within blended whiskey? Was there anything we could do? And, uh, you know, we've just been experimenting quite a bit with finishes and different things. And my view was, okay, you can finish single malt and it works really well. You can finish grain whiskey and it works really well. So, why don't we try and finish? A blend and, and you know treat a blend like a single malt and see if it actually evolves and, and becomes something interesting and you know follow that up with you know bottling at a higher ABV same way as we would do at a single malt no chill filtration or anything like that and uh, we started experimenting around and and you know we stumbled across um, in particularly rum casks and it just worked it worked as something that was interesting flavorsome had bags of character yet could uh, appeal to people that maybe hadn't really the palate hadn't evolved to try stuff like a peanut single malt or anything like that so so for us we wanted to create that bridge that starting point between what was there and where the category needs to go mm-hmm. and and with a, with a viewpoint of as well as that people weren't going to go out and spend like you know 150 dollars on, on a bottle of Irish whiskey it had to be priced at a price point that kind of got people accessible you know premium yet affordable so we ended up crafting, creating a whiskey that could hit a, a price point around you know forty dollars, and that's really I suppose, at a high level 
where the idea for the small batch came from. Yeah. Yeah. And I think an important point just to make as well, just about the category when this was launched, a lot of the blended whiskies were made in the same place. A lot of them were made in the same style. So, uh, you know, we used to get a lot of feedback from bartenders or whiskey consumers saying, you know, a lot of Irish whiskey is very samey. You know, what's the point of difference? And I think it was just important to present really functional, easy to understand points of difference of why we were different. And I think really easy to communicate. And, uh, you know, I remember when we launched it in the U.S., the amount of uh, people who were so surprised that they could get this style of whiskey within Irish because for years they had drank a very, very similar style from many, many different brands. And I think this had to be um, eye-opening for them to catch their attention because for many years it had been dominated by one or two brands making a very similar style. Well, I'm sipping on this right now, actually. Mm -hmm. It's quite delicious. This is generally the part of the show, particularly when we have as many things to taste as we do today. We have five to taste today, where we start tasting as we talk through your expressions. And we very much hope the two of you are tasting along with us. Oh, well, I've got a, I've got a small lot here in front of me. So, uh, yeah. Good. Well, considering it's uh, more drinking time in your time zone, <laughs> it's an hour. This is a professional affair. As a, in, in matters professional, it's always drinking time. Yeah. Sampling time. Sampling time. Yeah. We'll reference it. So your first uh, expression out was the small batch. And then where did you go from there? Yeah. So we wanted to have a bridge from what people knew Irish whiskey and start them on a journey of discovery. And then the idea was to basically deconstruct a blend into its individual components and a focus on single grain. Um, so for people who might be aware, the blend will be single grain and single malt blended together. And we wanted to create unique expressions of, of teeling whiskey that carried on that exploratory nature of using interesting cast to evolve an Irish whiskey. And our second release yeah. was our, our single grain. So for people, it's as close to, a, let's say, an American whiskey that you'll ever get from Ireland. And that single grain um, we use in Ireland is you know 95% corn in the mash bill and 5% um, uh, malted barley. So it has that corn sweet element to it, but it's distilled in the column still. So it's very clean. And what it normally is used, it's normally aged in ex bourbon barrels and used to blend it with the heavier malt or single pot still to create the style of whiskey that people would associate with Ireland or traditionally did. Yeah. Uh, a lot of whiskey drinkers, they've come to understand what single malt means, but single grain is still, I mean, it's an old classification, but it is still a mystery to most. Yeah. And the thing is, it is, you know, the grain, the just single grain, you know, you know, they don't get it. And I don't think, you know, Whiskey as an industry have done a great job educating people on it. But, you know, I think there will be more and more because uh, in Scotland, you've seen the likes of Compass Box and you've seen a lot of Gervin and other players out there, you know, trying to do things to bring some energy to it. And, and for me, it's just it's a very interesting canvas. It's a very light, I wouldn't say, you know, uh, bland, but it's like a white canvas. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, if you put a spirit into an interesting barrel, it really does evolve. And again, it's just a, something that hasn't really been done a lot. And what we have done for our single grain is uh, we take that lovely clean spirit ah. and we fully age it in ex-Californian Cabernet Sauvignon French oak wine barrels mm -hmm. and extracts a lot of the tannins and the kind of the spice from the French oak. But then you get that bag of the red berry uh, fruit uh, notes that come from um, the wine and it's a combination of spice underlying sweetness that comes from the original corn and uh, with that fruit with a very distinctive dry finish that makes it very interesting and just different and again it builds on this spectrum of flavors and um, that irish whiskey now has and really helped us i suppose build on the category of irish whiskey so not just something that was was a, as a me too or something that was something that was truly unique. And, and that's what we did with the single grain. And, you know, it's won a whole host of awards. It's part of our core Trinity collection and so forth. Um, so it was part of that journey to get us where we are now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned Trinity. And then I know you categorize, you label these three together as your holy Trinity. <laughs> but talk to us about that. I've always been curious. Yeah, well, it, you know, it was a couple of things. It, was, it kind of worked well with Teeling Trinity because there was three of them. Because if you think about it, the core of all what Irish whiskey is, it's a combination of 
different elements to bring together into one. You know, we just worked at a, a multitude of different areas and, and, you know, again, positive, good spirits. And I'd be honest with you, no huge marketing department, no huge <laughs> focus groups. It was something that we came up with. And yeah, since pretty cool. Let's go with that. We should probably have worked on that story a little bit more. So I'm drinking this one right now. Yeah. And I do totally see the resemblance of an American whiskey, but I do like that it's really, I taste the wine finish. And, but I also taste the corn really well. Mm-hmm. It, it's got some really nice legs, which I wouldn't know that there would be that many legs on such a light colored. Yeah. It's very viscous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's non chill filtered as well. And, you know, I think a lot of the uh, the fatty acids and some of the flavors in the barrel really stand up in the glass. And even that amber hue that comes from the liquid as well. Again, just something totally new that had never been done before. Uh-huh. And we had dabbled, as Jack had said, with... Uh, single grain that had been fully matured in ex-bourbon casks. And this was a departure, again, just because we wanted to try something different that hadn't been done before, and hopefully for the right reasons. So the third one in the Trinity is... Single malt. It was a single malt. Single malt. So yeah, I think, as Jack had said, like the deconstruction of the blend. So the small batch is the combination of grain and malt whiskey and then the single malt is just 100 percent malted barley so can you tell us the proportion on the blend uh, yeah i think one third malt two thirds grain would be the the rule of thumb but we um bottle to taste so depending on which batch sometimes you need to have a little bit more um, malt in there to to live up to the flavor profile that we want but in, in i suppose on average it's about one third malt two thirds grain okay very good Back to single malt. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. It's, yeah, no, no, it's fine. Single malt has obviously been dominated for many generations by Scotch single malt. And I think for us, we always felt that there was a, a bigger role that Irish single malts could play. So when we were um, when we were looking at this, we had seen that there was a role to play for a non-age statement Irish single malt, which, again, wasn't a copycat or a trying to recreate a Scotch single malt. This was something that was inherently Irish. So, you know, in Ireland, if you've had the pleasure of coming to uh, our beautiful island, we get a lot of rain. So the malted barley tends to be very, very lush, very fruit forward. So again, from a lot of the experimentations that we had done through our previous distillery, all the way up to some of the stuff that we were doing in Teeling, we had a good understanding of what we wanted to get to, but didn't know how to get there. Um, so had challenged um, Mr. Chasco um, with, I suppose, coming up with something that had a big, big fruity nose, you know, uh, a lot of spice, a lot of those fruit flavors on the palate, and then a really long finish. Just didn't know how we were going to get there. Um, and we were in a unique position of having a lot of different aged single malt finishing in different wine casks. So we had tasked them with it and um, it actually took, you know, I think it was close to 12 months, wasn't it, Jack, to get to the final combination of casks that we wanted. He kept, I suppose, vatting different malts and putting them together. And, you know, he had some sherry, he had some port, he had some elements, but it just wasn't right. So we actually delayed it. Mm-hmm. And we missed a, a key window uh, to make sure that we were happy with the with the liquid. And it ended up the liquid that we went with was very complicated, very complex. But once we actually tasted it, we were saying we have to bottle this. And we didn't exactly know what it was made up of when uh, we were blind taste testing with Alex. But it resonated with us what we felt was missing within Irish whiskey that could compete with not only Scotch single malts, but that emerging world single malt that you know we were seeing from you know japanese whiskies uh, australian mm-hmm. whiskies um american single malts mm-hmm. and that was inherently us so we ended up using a variety of different wine casks um white burgundy some white port some madeira some cab sav and some um fully matured single malt in in sherry that came together in this beautiful sort of symphony of, of flavors that really surprised us and has been very, very successful in terms of opening people's eyes Mm. to what a non-age statement Irish single malt can be. So Mm -hmm. taking that approach of the sum of the parts, almost like a chef putting together um, different composites of a recipe, and it's been really successful. It's won many world's best awards within Irish whiskey. And again, as we said, uh, a nice way in which we can open, I suppose, single malt drinkers yeah. to drinking Irish whiskey, where probably in the past they would have always associated Irish whiskey with just blended. Sure. It's very well balanced, and it is remarkably spicy. I last took a sip maybe two minutes ago, and it is still blooming. 
Mm. You know, it grows as well. So I think, you know, the longer you sit with it, it keeps going. So again, with uh, a lot of Irish whiskeys, one of the big feedback that we were getting is it kind of disappears or it was a bit short. With this one, the length of the finish is there. And I think for us, a, a big achievement to be able to create something like that um, within a category that just wouldn't be known for single malts. And I think from the process of doing a lot of our innovations, it gave us a lot of confidence to stand behind doing something like this. And again, I don't think we set out uh, to utilize so many different wine casks. It was more about finding the right liquids and something that we felt that could compete. Well, I think it competes very well. It's my favorite of the uh, five that you've sent me. So It's a good endorsement, exactly what we're trying to do. We're very much, as Stephen was saying, whiskey-led. It's all about what's in the bottle. That's the number one priority of everything that we do. And it's hard when you do things in smaller batches. That's why we put the bottling date on our releases so that you know there is subtle variations. It could be understood just because, as we said, we do in smaller things. But the underlying overarching taste profile should stay the same. Um, even if there's just a little bit more, let's say, tropical fruit in one batch versus you know a little bit more rich dry fruit in another one. But uh, you know, the single malt is a symphony of fruit flavors with a backbone of spice that uh, uh, we feel is is interesting and, and different and unique within the world of, of single malt. Well, turning our backs on the Holy Trinity, uh, God forbid, <laughs> we have the heretical pot still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, talking about a category that needs exp- explanation and education and single pot still is one of them. And, and it's a unique Irish recipe or mash bill and opportunity because it's protected now in the GI, the European GI, as uniquely Irish. And it goes back to basically all distilleries trying to cheat the taxman and find a way to reduce their cost of goods by introducing some unmalted barley mm. um, along with malted barley into the mash bill to try and reduce their costs. Because there used to be a tax on malted barley. And uh, it was a great way to get around that tax by bringing in some of the green spring barley and utilizing that. But what it does, it really does produce a unique style of whiskey in keeping with single malt, but with its own distinctive character. It really gets a lot more creaminess from utilizing that unmalted barley and brings in a nice, let's say, all spice kind of character. And uh, what we wanted to do was to revive the old Dublin way of doing it, because Dublin was synonymous with single pot stills, and most of the big brands were known as, as single pot stills, right. uh, if you look back at a lot of the old recipes. And to this day, there is only one large distillery that has been making single pot still, yes. um, has been releasing brands like Red Breast and Green Spot and Middleton. Uh, different things like mm-hmm. that. Middleton, yeah, and look, they're good at what they do, but we wanted to create something that was different within single pot still. So, and, uh, you know, with its own character to, let's say, give options within that. And that's what we've done with our single pot yeah. still. And this release was much anticipated. Yeah. And it was, you know, it's our first release from the new distillery. And what we wanted to do is be true from where we are and where we're based and, uh, you know, everything about the history and so forth. You know, we use that as inspiration and our very first batch of whiskey that we produced was utilizing the single pot still recipe mm-hmm. uh, of 50 percent unmalted barley and 50 percent malted barley mm-hmm. triple distilled and we took a while of you know again playing up on our our knowledge base and our inspiration using different casts we came up with a tree cast strategy to produce the single pot still that you have there and um, utilizing some virgin american oak some first fill ex bourbon and some sherry casts to produce the flavor that our single pot still is now known for and it really produces this really unique flavor and yeah. you know for me it was it's been described as a uh, spicy peach cobbler <laughs> in terms of character that's actually there which i think is a very easy way to understand really kind of that mixture of let's say white pepper white grape kind of roast peaches and baked biscuits all coming together with this kind of dry spicy uh, maple sugar type finish mm-hmm. that comes through as well so it's a, it's a really interesting yeah it's definitely very unique especially when compared to the other three that you have yeah it's, and, it's and, and a totally like different that. mash bill and i think for us we wanted to sort of present a, a single pot still for our generation rather than try and recreate what had already been done for 40 or 50 years i think right. like anything that we've done 
it's take inspiration from the past and just apply our own lens to it. And I think it's interesting to see, I suppose, people even understanding what a single pot still is, in particular, bringing back a Dublin single pot still and tasting it with people. All of a sudden, they're seeing there's all these different varietals of Irish whiskey, which they didn't know existed. And it's a really cool story and it's uniquely Irish. And there is no other category like that in the world. Yeah. There will be subsequent single pot releases, correct? We're, we're tasting the first one. Yeah. For the US, we're doing limited releases. So it has, a, you know, it's on, on a kind of allocation basis. And uh, I think uh, we'll have the second batch being released uh, this end of year. So we've already shipped it to the US and will be readily available in hopefully good liquor stores. And fortunately, I'm not sure how many uh, bars and restaurants will be open, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, sorry. I mean, Ireland's closed at the moment. Is it not fully? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're in the level five lockdown 2.0. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, if you are a Dublin pub owner and you did not serve food... Yeah. You have not been able to open since mid March. St. Patrick's weekend, yeah. So, yeah. Likewise, in several places in the US, Los Angeles among them, well, California, but California is so large, it's on a county by county basis. Yeah. So let's move on to the Black Pit. Black Pits. One word, two T's. Yeah. One word, two T's. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I want to know how you arrived at rendering Black Pits. This is something very different in the world of Irish whiskey. It's very different in the world of single malts. It's a triple distilled, peated single malt. And we took the inspiration for the name and from the branding, really from just a, an area that's literally right behind our distillery. So, so we were talking about, you know, we're in the old industrial engine of the city, the Liberties, but we're in the Liberties, there's all these little small pockets in different areas. We're in new market which was an old market square <laughs> called New Market because it was new. <laughs> and uh, behind the distillery, there's an area called Black Pits. And Black Pits was famous for two things. One was tanneries and the other one was malting houses. And until the 70s, there were some of the largest malting houses in the country in the area. And because of the unique malting that this product has, you know, I took the inspiration of calling it after, after that area because it's a pretty cool name. And the area has a pretty cool history. And we thought it was a good way to explain that. And uh, walking around the area in the Black Pits area, like only a couple of years ago, and they had the stencil on the wall saying Black Pits. And I went, wow, that's cool. And, and I took a picture of it. So when we were talking about doing the Black Pits uh, release, uh, we've actually taken inspiration from that kind of stencil, the industrial stencil on Black Pits, and we've screen printed onto our bottle and, and created a, a different look and feel to this expression um, to make it stand out from the rest of the family because it is different. And if you don't like a smoky whiskey, um, you might like this. <laughs> <laughs> or it might be a gateway into smoky whiskeys. What we're finding is that, that you know, in Ireland, Irish people just aren't used to having smoky whiskey, but they're finding our release quite accessible and interesting because the triple distillation, the third distillation that we do that is not normal for Scotch distilleries, they don't triple the still in general. Mm-hmm. Right, just a few do. Um, it strips out some of the phenols and some of the medicinal mm-hmm. and iodine character. And what, what you're left with is barbecue smoke. So it's distinctly smoky, but not as you might associate with, you know, the Lafroy, or the Lagavulins, and so forth. So it's this kind of fruity barbecue smoke and kind of, I get all this kind of like grilled pineapple and other characters going right. on. And we actually utilize Sauterne wine casks to extenuate some of that naturally occurring fruit elements that are there to make it just something that's really different and interesting. Oh, that's beautiful. A dessert wine. Wonderful. Wonderful. Right. And barbecue. You use barbecue in your marketing here in the US. We're into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's because it doesn't have that character of sitting in, in front of a peat fire. Right. It's there on the nose, but it's not as much on the taste. Mm-hmm. Um, so we think it's you know, uh, we're saying like, you know, Alex is the pit master and he's sitting in front of his <laughs> Applewood kind of barbecue uh, turning out the balls of black pits and uh, yes. uh, it has a kind of savory element to it that lingers. And, uh, you know, I actually made when this arrived, I have a smoker and I decided, you know what, I'm going to smoke some meat. And I also had some Irish wheat that I picked up at peat meat a couple of years ago. Very good. So I threw some Irish peat 
and some hickory and some lump coal in my smoker. And then I cooked some beef with this and it was really a good complement with each other. And everybody knows that I'm not a big peat lover. I know this. Yes. All my friends in the Scotch Club, every time I, I go to the peat and meet and every year, I'm like, <laughs> why do you even come here? You don't like peat. And I said, oh, I love the barbecue part. This might be your gateway back. Yeah. 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 I think uh, <laughs> we've had uh, so many people in Ireland just associate peat uh, or, you know, heavily peated with Scotch. So the idea of peated for them could be a massive, I suppose, uh, you either love it or you hate it. Yeah, they're thinking Octomore. They're thinking Ardbeg. They're thinking smoke out your ears, you know, uh, this more iodine medicinal. Mm-hmm. And in reality, I think that's not what Irish whiskey is about. You know, if we were presenting something like that from Ireland, it would be trying to mimic something that Irish whiskey isn't. So I think this is hopefully anyway, um, from our perspective, uh, a peated Irish whiskey that stands up on its own right. And I think um, the fact that it's triple distilled, you know, uh, bottled at 92 proof, non-chill filtered, and then using, Mm. you know, uh, a combination of Southern and and bourbon casks, um, again, just makes it stand out for the right reasons and not overly aggressive because that's not what we're looking for. Yeah, no, I I think it's very, very good. And I'm glad that it's not overly aggressive because then I wouldn't want to drink it. We discussed in brief your finishing, particularly with the small batch and the X rum casks, but Teeling has limited releases of special finishes. Carrie, you have as well, I know, because we did a dinner that featured the chestnut cask. There's the Brabazon series, and I've read something about pineapple. <laughs> Tell us what's going on here. Dude. <laughs> yeah, we love to play around with different things. And as he said, It's a very traditional category. Uh, There's lots of rules and regulations, but there's still plenty of opportunities to innovate and try unconventional, you know, approaches to try and do different things. And we've done a lot of collaborations with other spirits, beer, you know, wine uh, partners, mainly in Europe. They haven't really made it into the US yet. Um, We also played around with uh, different types of wood because in the regulations uh, in Ireland, it has to be aged and matured on the islands of Ireland in a wooden barrel, not classified as oak. So it opens up the options to use any type of wood that you can make a barrel out of. And we have played around with chestnuts. We played around with a whole multitude of different different expressions, Mm, like Brazilian mm -hmm. hardwood. Wow, cool. Very cool. Can you tell us about the Brabazon series, the, the fortified wine casks? And then don't forget the pineapple. The Brabazons were just a, a limited series that we did based on, I don't know if you've seen the the render of the image, um, the old Brabazon house, which is at the back of the distillery. It's an old restored building that was kind of in in a, in a bad uh, a bad way when we built the distillery and it got uh, restored. Um, and uh, we decided that we would do a single malt series based on the Brabazon family as this kind of, I suppose, rebirth of uh, not only... Um, ourselves, but also that family name. Um, and it was based around um, non-age statements, the first series one and two, non-age statements, single malts, which was bringing together, I suppose, the different elements of both sherry and port um, all together in a vatted malt um, and really just going out there. And as I said, trying to build a credibility for Irish single malts and doing it through these limited series Robinson 1 and 2 were brought out, it was 2018, 2019, and we did some subsequent bottlings of it. And then uh, now that that's all sold through this year, we actually evolved the Robinson series to an age statement. So in June of, of a pretty crazy year this year, we decided that uh, we'd bring out a new release, which was the, the Robinson 3, which is um, an evolution. It's a 14-year-old, so it's an age statement, single malt that we have matured in sherry casks and we uh, partnered with a bodega, um, a small family-led bodega, and just produced this limited edition. It's at a higher proof as well, so it's 49.5%. So I think if you aggregate that up, that's pretty close to... to um, I think we're over 100 proof on that one, uh, if close to it. But uh, you know, it's a, another example of some of the innovations. I think what we found is that there's more of an acceptance now for people looking for more exclusive aged Irish single malts. And out of the whole Brabazon series, this Brabazon 3 has been our most successful. It's sold out the quickest in a very strange year where we couldn't even get out and taste with people. We did a lot of stuff virtually online. 
with the fourth and final Brabazon actually planned for December of this year. So we're probably launching into a lot of markets in January 2021, which again is, is another evolution of some of the cask finishes that we've done. The pineapple cask, um, no shortage of innovations on our, on our side. We've done some stuff with some craft brewers. We've done some stuff at other wineries. And we had thought, look, wouldn't it be cool to evolve our rum cask and partner with those guys? And uh, we managed to get our hands on some of their uh, pineapple rum casks. And, you know, Alexander and Alex, the two of them are two peas in a pod when they get talking um, together. And I think Alex Chasco went down for a lot of due diligence to the chateau there in in France and shared some ideas. And uh, we managed to get our hands on some of those casks. And it's basically finishing our premium blend. So a similar composite to the small batch in these pineapple rum casks. And, uh, you know, the, the impact was huge. A lot of these tropical fruit flavors. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, obviously a bit of a, a cult following on the pineapple cask from Plantation. So, yeah, we brought that out over the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been, been hugely successful, mainly in limited markets where we share distributors in Europe. We're hoping to do something similar with them again maybe in 2021, because the interest in it was huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah well, well, Alexandre Gabriel and Plantation are well known for their innovation in rum making. Well, I have one more question about your relationship with Bacardi. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to us about that? Uh, well, it's very, it's actually a US-centric uh, partnership. In 2017, we were looking at our route to market in the US, and, and we had a, a very strong partnership with the Underwood family and Infinium Spirits are based in mm-hmm. Laguna Beach in, in California. And uh, we started off with them and uh, we made some good inroads. Uh, but, uh, you know, I felt we were probably less evolved in the U.S. than we were in terms of, of most of the other markets. And I felt like, you know, at that stage, a lot of the bigger guys like Brown Foreman and Diageo were looking at getting back into the category and, uh, you know, a lot of new entrants. And we were feeling that we were maybe missing an opportunity. So we were looking at ways to strengthen our, our roots market, specifically mm-hmm. in the U.S. market. Uh, the guys in McCarty had continually showed us interest. And I'll be honest with you, I was going, I went over to meet the people who had come and visited us and we shown around just to say, look, we're not interested. I wanted to do it face to face just to be. And we just said, look, unless you guys want to take on our brands in the US and put your muscle and your strength behind telling our story, you know, it's just, it's not for us. And they said, well, look, that's exactly what we want to do. And we feel now is a great time to do so. And, uh, you know, we have this incubation group of brands that we feel would be a great fit for you. Uh, You know, it was, it was an opportunity that we couldn't turn, turn Mm -hmm. up our nose at, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we we went back and we went, look, this is too good an opportunity to miss. And, uh, you know, we got into bed in 2017 company but also shared the vision of what we think we can do within irish whiskey mm-hmm. i want to give a big shout out to frank jacobka big frank. who has been our our point of contact <laughs> with teeling for some time and we love frank frank's a force yeah i think everyone <laughs> loves frank <laughs> <laughs> and uh yo that's what i mean they've, they've been able to really recruit very strong industry people who bring a, a dedication to just all things healing. So in terms of being able to do that, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that on our own. We wouldn't be able to do that if we had other partners. So, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, this is a very, it's all about relationships. And uh, by having people who have that industry experience and the depth of knowledge and the ability to present the brand in the right way is. Yeah, he's a master storyteller and he tells it well. He tells the healing story well. He does. Kerry, <laughs> yeah. cocktails? What are your go-tos? And, uh, you know, not necessarily whiskey cocktails or tealing cocktails, but just cocktails. What do you gentlemen enjoy? Yeah, well, a well-crafted cocktail uh, doesn't necessarily have to be whiskey forward in any which way. So in the hands of, you know, a good cocktail maker, mixologist, bartender, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, I'm open to trying anything. And I'm always surprised and delighted by, by what you can discover and enjoy, and particularly on our travels around the world and, and getting to, to go to some of the best mm-hmm. bars in the world to, to try different cocktails and also to hopefully get them inspired uh, by Irish whiskey and healing whiskey to, to, to try and do something with them. And I remember mm-hmm. our original launch uh, uh, back in the 2014, and literally it was a journey around 
all these bars with a bottle of peeling whiskey in my pocket. Right. And, and I was sticking on the bar and, and watching to see what these guys could create and so forth. So, so it's always a, a eye opening um, uh, experience for it. And, uh, you know, I think we put a lot of time and effort into trying to, as I said uh, earlier, give uh, bartenders something to work with, something with backbone, something with flavor. So even though saying that you have to understand the delicate nature of Irish whiskey versus, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a high strength American whiskey, um, you have to yeah. you know, get the balance of flavor correct. So again, it just depends on who you're sitting down to drink with, well, what I'll drink, but I'm, I'm always open to trying something different. So uh, and and you know what? It's been so long <laughs> since I've had the pleasure yeah. of, of sitting at a bar. I've been just making my owns at home, and you know what? I took a break over the last couple of months, but you know, I'm I'm I was just talking with my wife, and I said, "Look, I'm I'm, I'm shaking off the old taking out, sorry, the shaker again. And I'm going to start uh, experimenting and trying a couple of things ourselves." So uh, it's we're back to that, but really, I'm missing the engagement of sitting at bars, having those conversations, being surprised and delighted by different different cocktails and, and, you know, in particular, different tea and whiskey cocktails. Mm-hmm. And yeah, where Irish whiskey can fit in, which again, you know, when we were launching back in uh, 2013, 2014, it was very limited, you know, it was uh, maybe the Irish coffee was as jazzy as it got. Like, I think uh, a lot of people um, really didn't associate Irish whiskey with having a place in cocktails. And then obviously, the Dead Rabbit guys went out there and, and banged the drum um, and, you know, created a bit of a beachhead there in New York for Irish whiskey-centric cocktails. And I think um, what I've noticed, which is great, is that Irish whiskey, in terms of bar drinks, isn't just for St. Patrick's Day anymore for, you know, I suppose the Irish coffee. It's a 12-month, all-year-round thing and where we've, I suppose, uh, utilized the distillery as kind of this would say uh, showcase for what you know 12 months of irish whiskey cocktails could look like so we would utilize different ingredients be it local ingredients or you know different riffs depending on the time of year so the autumnal old-fashioned and 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 different things that we would use a lot of local ingredients all the way up to during the summer months taking a riff that sort of tiki style drinks which again you would never have associated with irish whiskey and it's great that we can play in that space with more Mm -hmm. you know uh, having a bit of fun with it much deeper appreciation for their their craft after spending the last couple of months trying to churn out uh cocktails like look they're 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 drinkable, but the time and effort of the prep and everything that you need to do, I totally have a full appreciation for their skill set. Yeah, two fingers of teaming. Yeah. <laughs> In a manner of speaking, we have a bartender to thank for today because I, speak, I met the two of you at a cocktail bar, the old Dubliner in Long Beach, California, Christy Caldwell. Let's let's thank Christy. Yeah, Christy's a great guy. Indeed. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I don't remember great. what was served, but it was good. Yeah. I think um Christy's been a long term supporter and people like him and his, his business partners there um really backed us from the start and you know, I think stocked a lot of our products very early on and I know through Aiden who would have been based over there, one of the, the younger Irish Aiden McNally, yes, is how I discovered the whiskey. It was June 2015. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, based there, and I know Christy gave him a, a, you know, a huge amount of support, and like that, he's Christy is a, a younger Irish guy who's kind of trying to reinvent, I suppose, what an Irish pub could be as well, where, you know, it wouldn't just be associated with maybe the more traditional style. Um, he was trying to reinvent it, and I think like that, we saw that emergence of those new generation of bartenders of a similar generation of us who sort of resonated or what we were trying to do resonated with them. I think they wanted to present a more modern interpretation of what Ireland was rather than that nostalgic, the old pub version, which again, I think is fine, but it's not the future. Quite the tale. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you guys for all your time. In case you couldn't tell, Kerry and I are big fans of the brand. Ah, look, we're delighted to talk you through it. It's unfortunate we can't be there in person to to have a few drinks with you. Uh, That's right. Next year in the Holy Land. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, they say whiskey is a is a marathon, not a sprint. So, um, you know, I think you have swings and roundabouts and uh, ups and downs. But um, hopefully, long term, we'll uh, we'll get back to what we're doing best, which is you know, getting in front of people, tasting whiskey, getting people to Dublin, you know, visiting the distillery and. 
we have no shortage of fun stuff coming up in terms of stuff that we have laid down. So uh, watch this space and uh, just appreciate your time. And mm-hmm. as always, uh, Philip, always very nice to speak to you. Yes, indeed. 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 Absolutely. And then hopefully if things take off with our show, we will be able to come visit you on site and showcase some of your beautiful distillery. Indeed. So. Yeah, this has been an undiluted pleasure. So anytime, uh, we're delighted to have you. And thanks for the interest of having you on the podcast in, in the meantime. And, you know, appreciate your interest and support. And uh, hopefully, as you say, we'll get to see you in person sometime soon. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you, guys. Yeah, slaunch it. Keep safe. And uh, we'll see you soon. Looking forward. World of Wheezy is up next. Stay with us. The Center for Culinary Culture, home to the Cocktail Collection and LA Food and Drink Museum, has a YouTube channel that offers a diverse and growing slate of food and drink series, featuring a mix of how-to, lively talk, and culinary entertainment. Already streaming are culinary quickies, Le Cocktail Du Jour, V is for Vino, and this podcast, Spirits of Whiskey. Upcoming shows include Cocktails, The Grand Tour, a new series starring Jonathan Pogash, AKA the cocktail guru, the award-winning music and booze with Mo, featuring Mo Herms and a series of musically spirited cocktailians. And an all new wine podcast, hosted by Silver Pin certified sommelier, Stacy Hunt. We're streaming culinary culture, so please visit YouTube, search for the Center for Culinary Culture and subscribe now. The Center for Culinary Culture, Telling the story of food and drink, one taste at a time. Hey Louise, good to have you coming on the show this week. How are you? I am well. How you been, Carrie? Good, good, good. We just uh, got off the phone with the Teeling Brothers, and we had expressions from them, and I dropped some off to you. I uh, wanted to see what you thought of them, and which one you wanted to make some kind of pairing and or recipe suggestion with. Well, I, after tasting all of those teeling expressions, I decided to go with the small batch. And I think for me, what did it was the fact that I could taste like the rum casks as a presence, like the final resting of this whiskey and rum casks that immediately got my mind kind of working in a bunch of different directions in terms of like, all right, well, what would I pair this with? And also I really wanted with this one, I wanted to figure out something that I could, some dish that I could also use the whiskey in as well, not just to, you know, not just as a pairing. So then I got to thinking like, I do this version of like a cornmeal cake that I oftentimes will soak with different types of um, liquors, sometimes a mix of different liqueurs. And then I thought, well, what if I made it like if I were to make a cocktail with this whiskey, but use that mix to soak my cornmeal cake. So that's kind of where my mind went. So basically, I loved the idea of mixing a little bit of this whiskey with a touch of rum for some sweetness and a lot of fresh citrus and using that to soak the cake and then topping it off with some fresh whipped cream and some tropical fruit. Like, wow, not a pairing you would ever expect with an Irish whiskey, but I think one that would pleasantly surprise someone if they had it. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. Yeah. And like the corn in the cornmeal cake would like pick up the corn in the whiskey you know it was like that's kind of how I was thinking about this one yeah now that sounds really good I would totally dig that awesome it's like a my North American take on a whiskey from across the pond awesome I can't wait to try that myself that sounds amazing so if you have some ready I will uh, swing by later and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get right on that thank you so much for this wonderful uh, food idea and um, I can't wait to see what you have for us next week yeah, it's it's going to be a good one. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's Whiskey Chronicles, as well as tasting notes and recommendations from today's World of Wheezy. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, salam. Slunch
You can become a sustaining supporter of Spirits of Whiskey by making a monthly donation. Just visit the Spirits of Whiskey page at anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm forward slash spirits dash of dash whiskey and click on the support button. And if you really like us, give us a five star rating and a review. Thank you. Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.